Welcome to Target Free Thursday Nights at the Walker Art Center. My name is Sarah Peters. I am the Assistant Director of Public Programs here in the Education Department, and I want to thank all of you for coming out this evening and braving the ticket line. You are the lucky few um, who are seated in here, so be grateful. We're in for an excellent evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Thursday nights are your opportunity to come to the Walker for free every week. Gallery admission is free from 5 to 9 every Thursday night, and thanks to the support of Target, we are able to offer programs like this for free. And there's something not quite this big, but all kinds of other programs happening every week. So check, um, pick up a calendar before you go, or check the inside of your program notes where there um, is a list of upcoming programs. This, we have a packed schedule this winter with artist talks and design talks, gallery tours, and art lab activities where you can actually make something inspired by what you have seen in the galleries. Um, and one of the ongoing programs that I wanted to mention specifically is called the Artist Bookshelf, which is a book club that attempts to make some connections between contemporary literature and contemporary art. We read books that are related thematically in one way or another to exhibitions on view and then discuss them together. Uh, for instance, we read Neil Gaiman's book American Gods earlier this fall in conjunction with the exhibition Heart of Darkness, which is on view upstairs right now through this weekend and is um, an excellent exhibition that I recommend you try to squeeze in if you have a chance. And we talked about some of the ideas that both Neil's book and the exhibition shared. Um, and it's, it's a great way to talk about books and art at the same time. And so um, there's a listing about that in your program notes. If you would like to be on the mailing list and get the postcard and email updates about the book club, there is a sign-up sheet outside at the rain taxi table right outside of the cinema that also has postcards about the upcoming season of books. Um, I would also like to mention that if you like the free access that you have to the Walker on Thursdays, there is a way for you to have free access all the time, and that is by becoming a member. Yearly memberships include perks like getting in free all the time, um, discounted event tickets, and discounts at both the Walker shop and the restaurants that we have here, and being in the know um, because you get the calendar in your mailbox. And there's information about membership or uh, uh, URL to the membership site in your program notes. Um, tonight's talk is being webcast live, so that means we're live on the web right now. Um, that also means that when we get to the Q&A section of tonight's program, I ask that you use the two microphones that will be running up and down either aisle. The ushers will have them. Um, please use those to ask your questions and also stand up when you're asking your question or leaving your comment. That way your voices will be recorded onto the webcast and onto the archive of this program that lives on the Walker website at the Walker channel. And that address is also in your program notes. Um, and one other housekeeping note is that um, it's fine if you take pictures during this program, but please do not use a flash. It's um, very distracting to the speakers on stage and also creates kind of a glare on the web. So lastly, but perhaps most importantly, tonight's Freeverse program is a partnership with the locally produced literary magazine and literary force called Rain Taxi Review of Books. And there is no way that all of the free verse poets and novelists and literary innovators would ever make it to the Walker stage without this partnership and without the hardworking people at Rain Taxi who have sat with me and sifted through all of the details of putting um, this program and many other programs together. So please pick up a copy of Rain Taxi as you leave. Please support Rain Taxi. And I would like to extend a great thanks to uh, Rain Taxi's editor, Eric Lorberer, who um, really worked hard to make this event happen. So please welcome Eric to the stage, who will introduce our guests for tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I introduce our guest tonight, I also want to thank you all for coming. I'm glad you can be here with us. I want to thank Sarah Peters and everyone here at The Walker for partnering with Rain Taxi on the Free Verse series. Uh, this begins our seventh year of collaboration, and it is a sincere pleasure in every respect to help spotlight the literary arts at this great institution. Uh, I want to also thank tonight Dreamhaven Books for their support. 
I suspect many of you here already know about Dreamhaven, but for those who don't, this local independent bookstore is a treasure trove for speculative literature of all kinds. You can find them in Uptown or on the web at dreamhavenbooks.com. While you're prowling around the internets, please also visit Rain Taxi at raintaxi.com to learn about some of the other authors and artists we like, to find out more about other events we sponsor in the Twin Cities, and this coming week to check out the fun stuff you can bid on during our annual fundraising auction. Rain Taxi is a nonprofit organization, so whether you make purchases or subscribe to our magazine or simply donate some money out of the goodness of your heart, you are helping us to exist and to provide events such as this. So that brings me full circle. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Neil Gaiman and Dave McKean. The work of both of these men is very dear to us at Rain Taxi, and it's a privilege to be able to bring them together tonight. While this program has been a dream of ours for some time, I'm particularly glad it worked out that we can do it as 2007 gets underway, because this is something of an anniversary year for these two. 20 years ago, they published their first collaboration, a graphic novel called Violent Cases, which immediately placed them in the front ranks of those pushing the boundaries of the comics medium. During 1987, they also created the arresting miniseries Black Orchid, which upended more than one convention of the superhero genre. And later in the year, in the midst of a hurricane, as legend has it, Neil conceptualized his groundbreaking epic, The Sandman, a work in which rather than chronicle the mere exploits of a character, he would excavate the dark recesses of a mythos. Every installment of the series was heralded by the Dave McKean cover images that were equally revolutionary, reinventing as they did the paradigms of comic book cover art. That's a pretty good year, and it has been followed by many other good years, ones in which these two artists, both together and separately, have created wonders. There's been Dave's mammoth and marvelous graphic novel Cages, artwork for an astonishing array of books and CDs and magazines such as The New Yorker, and dazzling short films and volumes of photography. From Neil, there have been comics galore, thank God, but also novels and short stories and radio plays and screenplays, all of which have helped spread his uniquely talented wordsmithy to the far corners of the globe. And jointly, Neil and Dave have given us over the years graphic novels that continue to explore and explode the form, children's books with just the right amount of creepiness, and of course, the enchanting full-length feature film, Mirror Mask. It all adds up to the incontrovertible conclusion that Gaiman and McKean are the finest artistic duo to emerge from the British Isles since Lennon and McCartney. And the fact that they continue to inspire and challenge each other means they continue to inspire and challenge us. Tonight, we have asked them to inspire and challenge each other in front of us, and we couldn't be more delighted that they've agreed. Please join me in welcoming Neil Gaiman and Dave McKean. I want to be John Lennon. I want to be John Lennon. I want to be John Lennon. Okay. Hello. <laughs> now, now we're arguing about who's Paul McCartney and John Lennon. It's pathetic. It's absolutely <laughs> pathetic. Neil has inexplicably become an audience member <laughs> for 10 minutes or so. I'm just going to show you some uh, stuff. I brought some stuff. Um, I was going to start with um, uh, a quick showreel of, of shots uh, from all sorts of things. Short films, shots from uh, feature, uh, first feature film, Mirror Mask bunch of things um, and it's about three minutes long so I'll start with that if that's okay.
Um, so I'll just crash through this stuff pretty quickly because I've got a lot of uh, images. Um, Neil and I met a long time ago, uh, far, far too long ago, um, when we were both working for a magazine that never happened. Um, and Neil had written a short story called Violent Cases, and I really liked it. And so that was the first book that uh, we did and started working for uh, DC Comics in New York. Um, this is a, a, um, a Batman book that I did uh, with um, Scottish writer Grant Morrison. That's Batman on the left. I never quite understood Batman. I, wanted, I, just, I, I lo always loved comics, but I've never been much of a superhero fan, and I just didn't really get Batman at all with the ears and the little goldy, goldy thing on his chest. I never, never understood him, so I turned him into a sort of man-animal. Um, and from there, just started doing covers for Neil's uh, series, The Sandman, which I'm sure you are uh, familiar with, um, and Hellblazer, which is John Constantine, recently played by Keanu Reeves, which is an interesting uh, casting choice for a <laughs> Newcastle-based, heavy-smoking person. Um, and then The Sandman really was the series that... Uh, uh, reached the, a new audience, I think, really. It, it reached a book-reading audience. Um, and so the comics were repackaged as books, and so these are some of the covers from the, from the book editions. Uh, and then these are some of the covers I ended up doing, carrying on, trying to wring the last amounts of money out of the Sandman franchise. <laughs> uh, Sandman <laughs> Presents and The Dreaming. Um, uh, Cages is a book that... It's my one book that I wrote. Um, and I love working with Neil and I love uh, uh, working with, with, with other writers as well but I really fancy just occasionally to try and do something that's uh, in my own head and Cages was uh, the book uh, that I wrote which was a collection of short stories really that coalesced into a long story and a much simpler way of drawing um, I'd got very tired of painted comics these very elaborate illustrated comics I thought it needed to be a much lighter easier way of storytelling this is God on the right hand side here with his cat <laughs> uh, very important um, and Cages is uh, about stories the importance of stories in our lives and what we believe in and what we uh, sort of uh, need to get us through through the day really um, and a strange thing happened uh, w when we've been working together Neil had always got letters from people um, and I'd never got any letters from people because I was illustrating I think people think that illustrators can't read because um, <laughs> Neil got all the fan mail here and, um, and so I'd started I'd made, I did cages, I wrote cages and started to get ma mail and I started to get letters from people. And Cages was originally serialised as ten uh, magazines uh, before being a, a, a single volume. And um, the third issue came out. So we're, only, we're not even a third of the way through the book here. And I started to get letters from people of which the tone was, oh, yeah, I get this. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I can see what you're doing here. Fine. Um, and that's incredibly irritating, really. <laughs> Uh, because we're not even a third of the way through the book. You don't want to be getting letters like that. You just don't want that. So this is in the fourth issue. I wrote this sequence, um, of which this is part, that was completely inexplicable. <laughs> um, made no sense at all. Um, and it, but it stopped the letters, which was the main <laughs> purpose of the exercise. Uh, and... <laughs> Uh, and while I doing, was doing Cages, we did a book called Mr. Punch, which I'm still really uh, proud of. Um, I think uh, Neil had, written a, uh, had read a book called How to Do Punch and Judy and uh, realised what, what a fantastic thing Punch and Judy is. Punch and Judy in England is a puppet show. Everybody in England has a sort of trace memory of Punch and Judy shows on the beach. And... Um, so everybody remembers little things like the sausages and the puppet, Mr. Punch Puppet, saying, well, that's the way to do it, in a funny voice. Um, and lots of hitting. But nobody remembers the plot of Punch and Judy, which is appalling. Um, the plot is uh, Mr. Punch is left in charge of the baby uh, while his wife goes away for a bit. The baby starts crying. He can't stop the baby crying, so he kills the baby. The wife comes back, is not happy, 
Um, so he kills his wife. The policeman comes to arrest him. He kills the policeman. It's, it's a serial killer story, uh, essentially, with this sort of relentless series of murders. And so we built the story around that, that real spine, that hard spine of, of murders. And uh, the story is about a man remembering this particular little bit of violence in his childhood and having no context for it at all. Um, another book, uh, Signal to Noise, was uh, commissioned by The Face magazine, which is a sort of star magazine in England when they thought they would finish. And so the story we ended up doing was about a man dying and, um, and uh, the, the sort of feelings towards, coming towards in the 90s towards the end of the uh, turn of the millennium. And um, we tried to put a, a lot of noise into it. The story, the book was called Signals and Noise, which was a kind of a metaphor for the magazine. You know, you pull out the important bits, the signal, the stuff that means something to you, and reject the noise. And at the time, though, this is pre-computer. I had not bought a computer at this point. So I ended up taking lots of photographs and things down to a colour copy machine in a local place and abusing this colour copy machine. And, uh, and pressing all the buttons at once and shining lights into it and doing all the things you're not supposed to do to colour coffee machines. And Neil had found a programme called Babel, which scratch-mixed text. This says, um, you know you can set fire to the capacity to say. Um, you know, I think, I think it means something. I don't really know what it means at all, but it's kind of elusively profound, I think, I like to think of it. Um, and then this is a book of short comics called Pictures That Tick, which is... Um, really, what I love about comics, really, I still love just sitting down drawing, uh, pen and ink. Um, this is a, a story called His Story, which I'm uh, particularly happy with. This is puppeteering on the surface of a photocopier, colour photocopier again with objects and flowers and various things. Um, time's pressing, so I'm going to hack through these a bit. This is a, a collection of illustrations. I'm still doing a lot of illustrations for magazines. This is, this is my son here. Um, I, I am allowed to do this. I am the legal father. It's allowed. I've looked it up. Um, he really hates that picture. Um, this is uh, an illustration for ad illustrating a, um, a short story in a magazine. This is made up of... Um, the story f was from a fly's point of view. And I ended up... Doing, I have a beard, as you probably noticed. And I'd shaved that morning, and it's made up of bar uh, my, my chippings... The body of the fly is made up of my chippings in treacle on a scanner. I get through a lot of scanners in my line of work. Um, uh, rather more serious, this is a piece uh, done as a response to the events in, in New York, 9-11. The, the star, the, still on the side there is from a... I turned the illustration into a short film for MTV, which ran um, a year after those events. Um, various illustrations for New Yorker and silly films, and um, a magazine that, run, that uh, runs uh, transcriptions of screenplays. This is the screenplay for Pi. Uh, book covers for various unknown, irrelevant, <laughs> you know, kind of authors. <laughs> uh, film posters and film festival posters, including Telluride, the one on the right, which is the best film festival I've been in. Um... This is an exhibition uh, poster for a touring sort of retrospective show that toured around Europe in the last few years of my various works. This is a DVD, DVD cover for my fa one of my favourite films. I wouldn't say my favourite. It's certainly one of my favourite films in Chandelou, Bunuel's first film. A shocking film. I think if anybody sees it even now, it's shocking. It was wonderful. They had a fantastic, surreal exhibition in a, in a terrific gallery in uh, London last year, and it was great to see all of these, you know, gallery goers, these often very genteel people <laughs> walking into a room to see, oh, what's this? And uh, Unchandelou, and it comes up and it starts, and Bunuel's there sharpening his razor, and then he slits the girl's eye, and everybody's, oh, no, I don't want to see that, and they all leave. <laughs> Fantastic. It's all as shocking now as it was, you know, nearly 100 years ago, which is amazing. Um, and lots of record covers. I've, st I've always loved music and worked to music all the time. I still play music every day. And so uh, CD, uh, I fancy doing CD covers. So a bunch of these. Tori Amos uh, cover. Uh, quite a few for Michael Nyman, including uh, the piano. 
um, and recent film Wonderland, which is where I saw the actress Gina McKee for the first time, and I always thought she was amazing, and so I wanted her in our first film, Mirror Mask. But it was this film, Wonderland, that I saw her in. Very recommended. Uh, Bank or Frontline Assembly, done a lot of work for them, Canadian group. Fear Factory, Stabbing Westwood. I get a lot of bands called... Poke your mother with a pointy, st- <laughs> you know, uh, really hard, you know, those kind of things. I don't know why. I seem to attract those sorts of things. Um, this is uh, the first release on my own record label, which is called Feral. Um, I started with a fantastic English uh, saxophone player called Ian Ballamy. And this is his first uh, record on the label called Food. And we. Um, we got some great reviews. It's, uh, it's a really good album, but there's a very small audience for avant-garde Norwegian jazz in England. <laughs> um, but, you know, but we got some great reviews, and one of them, uh, we, it, with e- in each box, we, did, uh, we had the CD and some postcards, and then we, we had a twister pasta, or a, or a uh, bay leaf, or a dried chilli, or something like that. And we got a fantastic review that said it's it's a beautiful CD, and if you buy 50 or 60 copies, you get a free meal for two out of it, <laughs> which is accurate, actually. Um, the second feral uh, CD, Pepper Street Interludes, Dream Theatre, Counting Crows, which was actually the cover of um, the first children's book we did together, The Day I Swapped My Dad for Two Goldfish, and the lead singer of Counting Crows, Adam Derwitz, absolutely loved it. I tried for three hours in a hotel lobby in London to try and talk him out of it or try and get me to, you know, try and get him to change something about it, anything, the colour, the hat, uh, the direction the fish were swimming, anything. But he, wouldn't, he would absolutely loved it and ended up just going with that. Buckethead <laughs> has a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket on his head. Hence the name. Uh, Bill Bruford, fantastic drummer, uh, from a band called King Crimson, who I still really love from, from my childhood, but I still really love them. Uh, but this is a Bruford's band, Earthworks. And any chance I can get comics into a job, I will. I'm happy if I can crowbar comics in there somewhere. So I did a little story uh, for this CD release. Every time one of the band members, and there's a sax player and a bass player and a piano player, every time they play, uh, the music blows the hats off pedestrians that were walking by and this uh, pair of hands comes down and deposits a brightly coloured animal on their head I, I have no idea what I was doing that day <laughs> uh, but that was, the, that was the story and then Bill Bruford comes out and he's the drummer and he plays very very quickly lots and lots of notes so everybody gets a brightly coloured animal <laughs> it, was, it was a good day I, I enjoyed that day um, this is uh, Neil singing, isn't it, Neil? No. Uh, this is a collection of songs based on Neil's writing and uh, a recent one. And an, uh, another one I just finished, actually, another one for Frontline Assembly. And this is also my son, and he loves this picture. As opposed to the being peeled like potato picture, which he hates, he loves being the big robot guy with the arm. So um, it's the only picture I've ever done that he really likes, which is sad. Um, <laughs> And then lots of other things. Again, time is pressing, so I'll speed on. Um, the launch image for Sony, Sony PlayStation in England. Um, advertising for our government, would you believe? Social, social care. Uh, Nike. Nike. Uh, children's books. Um, this is Wolves in the Walls, which uh, we did together. Uh, that's the wolf playing the tuba, as they do. Um, day is what my dad for two goldfish which uh, big seller on Father's Day, I understand. Um, much simpler style, really just uh, nice, simple, drawn style. Coraline, I'm sure Neil will tell you about that when he speaks. And the book that um, I've nearly finished, I've been on this book for about 40 years, isn't it about 40 years now I've been on this book, uh, called Crazy Hair. Um, I've been trying to finish it. It's a a sort of children's poem, so a few spreads from that book. Very colourful. 
Um, a series of books called Varjak Poor, about a cat who has to learn to fight. A lot of fun with this, playing with a cat's perspective on the world. He has to go out into the world and find a dog, but he doesn't know what a dog looks like. So he assumes that this big, loud thing coming towards him is a dog, uh, but it's not. Um, a little book with Ray Bradbury, um, Homecoming, um, originally written for Charles Adams to illustrate, but um, that never happened, so uh, I ended up doing it. Uh, that was out recently. A little story with my son, uh, again, makes an appearance um, for a book called Guys Write for Guys Read. It was edited by John Sheshka, uh, noting that uh, girls in America read Boys in America don't read very well. Um, and so he put together a, a lovely anthology of, of stories uh, directly, you know, specifically for boys. Boys, uh, it's written by boys for boys, boy stuff. So we did a little story together. Um, a book with the Running Stones that toured with them, Booty Lounge. Um, Ian Sinclair, who's a fantastic London writer, mind like a library, really extraordinary guy. Um, various other things, Stephen King. Um, and then a few things with John Cale. Um, I illustrated and designed his autobiography, What's Welsh for Zen? Um, and had a lot of fun with the design and layout of that one. Uh, and got some comics in there, which is always a good thing. Um, and then I've started doing these little travel books, uh, just drawings when I visit a city, doing a little travel book. This is the Vienna book. Um, this is a new one, um, Barcelona, uh, various drawings. And then lots of photographs. I got into photography while I was doing the Sandman series. Um, so this is uh, from the first monograph called A Small Book of Black and White Lies. Uh, and the second one called Option Click, which is more digitally manipulated photographs. And then two books uh, based on a tarot deck. Colour photographs, and then the minor arcana, darker, darker stuff. I'd just done Mirror Mask, which is a children's film, and a couple of children's books for over over two years. I was desperate to do something darker and harder, so all those images came out in that book. I think um, I designed a musical called uh, called The Stat, based on obviously Anne Rice's um, writing. Music by Elton John. Not, you know, not so good. Lyrics by Bernie Taupin. Very good. I, I, like, I like Bernie a lot. So that was an, a, a complete disaster. But much happier experience. Uh, Wolves in the Walls, which is a children's um, operetta, I suppose, uh, put together in London. Great fun with these sort of crazy wolf puppets. Um, various designs for the Harry Potter films, uh, the, sec the second and third ones. Um, the Dementors. I've learned that they're called Dementors now. I used to call them the Shouty Guys, but I had to do. I gave a little talk at my kids' school, and my, my daughter was absolutely adamant that I had to know the names, otherwise they'd lynch me at this school. Um, and then film. Uh, the final little bit here. Um, I had a, a kind of change of heart in the last uh, about six, seven years ago. I really fancied making a film. Um, I've always loved films, and, um, and I love drawing, and I love making comics and books and all these sorts of things. But I miss sound, I think that's the thing. I miss music. Uh, so I really fancied making a film. So I wrote a couple of short films. The first one, and just made them, because nobody was going to knock on my door saying, do you want to make a film? So I thought I'd just make them. Uh, this is called, uh, so I made a film called The Week Before, which is about... God making the world. It's the week when God made the world, but it's the week before he made the world. So it's the week that was supposed to be the week when he made everything, but on Monday morning, couldn't think of anything, went fishing instead, uh, invited his neighbour, who's the devil, around for a game of cards, and generally put it off until he couldn't put it off any longer, that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> And um, and I always and the, he play, the game of in the game of cards the devil wins of course with three sixes and um, <laughs> he has a big book and they they they're obviously divvying up everything in the known universe between them and um, I, we play one game of cards and he wins and I was trying to think what he could win 
And I, end, I ended up thinking of Belgium. He would win Belgium. The, <laughs> the devil would win Belgium. And I always forget this. And I show the film to European film festival audiences. And it gets to this point. I thought, oh, God, I've got, I've got that bit about Belgium in there with the devil winning Belgium. And there's always some Belgians in the audience. Uh, fortunately, they're a very, very understanding race. <laughs> Um, the other film is called Neon, which is a little ghost story set in Venice, um, narrated by John Cale. Um, I'd, I'd uh, done some signings with John, and I loved his voice. He has this beautiful, melodic, Welsh, New York voice that sings along. So I got him to do the narration. Um, a couple of television films with Ian Sinclair. Um, and then this feature film called Mirror Mask, which uh, sort of came out of the blue and gobbled up a huge chunk of, of uh, my life making uh, for the Henson Company, uh, which involved, obviously, uh, writing with Neil and then storyboarding the whole thing, designing the characters, uh, working with a small group of art students, basically. There's the first, first job out of art school for 15 uh, art school grads. It's the only way we could make it. And they designed the characters. And then I composited the, uh, the scenes um, and then, so finally, it's just a few stills from that. Uh, this is a little rabbit band that lives in a small red cube in the Prime Minister's hat. Um, I've, sh I've, sh done, I've done this lecture and, and, and shown the film or bits of the film to uh, lot, you know, lots of audiences now. It's always kids' audiences that ask the best questions. I, sh I showed... I explained this stuff to my, my, uh, my kids' school. I went to the school and did a little talk. And I was explaining that this is a rabbit band and they live in the small red cube in the Prime Minister's hat. And this girl went, <laughs> yes, yes. Does he know? <laughs> See, you, you'd never get that question from an adult audience. You just, um, this is a very confused sphinx played by Robert Llewellyn. And um, this is Rock Gina McKee as a huge floating giant face. And finally, um, well, uh, hopefully next thing, really. Um, I've uh, written a script based on a book that Neil and I did together called Signal to Noise, huge expansion of that book, um, which was a book that I always loved, but I thought we could do so much more with it. Um, and we did it on the radio for the BBC, and it got better but I still thought it had a long, uh, a long way to go because the, the question at the centre of the book is such a great question. What do you choose to do? What do you do with the, the time that you have left in your life? And I think everybody at some point kind of thinks about that a bit. And this is about a man who discovers that he has a, a real deadline. He only has five or six months to go and how that sort of changes your life choices. So I'm hoping that's the film we get to make next. And that's it. Thank you. Cheers. Hello. So my original plan was that I was just going to get up here and yammer at you for a while before going into the conversation thing. And then I discovered that Dave was actually prepared <laughs> and had uh, brought along things to show you. And my hackles rose. <laughs> And I thought, oh, hang on, if he's showing stuff and then I just get up and burble, people will go, all oh, right, yeah. He's just making it up as he goes along, which would have been true. <laughs> so I thought, well, he's showing some of the stuff he does. So in between burbling, I will do some of the stuff I do, which is read a few things. So I get to do a few readings um, and also talk for a little bit. And then Dave and I are going to go and sit down in those two chairs and continue talking. <laughs> Establishing once and for all which one of us is Lennon and which is McCartney. <laughs> and frankly, seeing that both of us are sure that one of us is probably George and the other is Ringo... <laughs> This may prove problematical. 
Um, so I met Dave. The first time I met Dave was 1986, which is about 21 years ago. And it was, as Dave says, in the offices of a magazine that didn't happen. Um, as time went on, we were going in for these weekly meetings for this magazine that was going to happen, put together by an editor who said that it was, uh, his, his, he'd found young, talented people who'd never done anything in the field of comics before. We did not know that this was because people who had done things in the field of comics before would not work with this person. <laughs> um, who was a very nice man, very sweet, but he lied. Um, and slowly, we started to figure this out. We were all rather slow on the uptake, but eventually we... This at a point where you're realizing that the reason why we're having meetings on Wednesday night in the office of a telephone sales company is because he was fired from there, but he still has the key. <laughs> um, that kind of thing. So, um, but we met. Dave was still at art school, and uh, I was a young journalist, still saving up my first leather jacket. And um, Dave was obscenely talented even then. You know, he was 22 going on 23, and he was as talented an artist as I'd ever run into. Um, which meant, of course, that the guy who was doing the, uh, who, who started the magazine that wasn't going to happen, had Dave working on his projects. And I was off doing some other things. And a young man named Paul Gravett, who ran a wonderful magazine called Escape, and has gone on to become um, the, the, the expert on graphic novels. Paul Gravett in the UK writes books on graphic novels, and he is the man you turn to. And Eddie Campbell, a Scottish writer and artist currently living in Brisbane, Australia, for reasons that I do not understand. Um, <laughs> calls him the man at the crossroads because he says that Paul is there for anything that ever happens that's important. And indeed, Paul came down to see this magazine because the guy who ran it had bought advertising for the magazine in Escape, which he never paid for. Um, and uh, Paul loved what I was writing and loved what Dave was drawing and said, would we do something together? And we said yes. And I'd written this thing called Violent Cases, and I showed it to Dave, and Dave said, yep, he'd draw it. And we went back to Paul and said, would you mind if instead of doing a seven-page strip for your magazine, we did an original graphic novel, and you published it? <laughs> and he said, you're right. <laughs> so that was how we started. This is a poem called Locks which I wrote about telling stories. Probably everything I've written has been about telling stories. But this is more about telling stories than some of the things. We owe it to each other to tell stories, as people simply, not as father and daughter. I tell it to you for the hundredth time. There was a little girl called Goldilocks, for her hair was long and golden and she was walking in the woods and she saw cows. You say it with certainty, remembering the strayed heifers we saw in the woods behind the house last month. Well, yes, perhaps she saw cows, uh, but she also saw a house. A great big house, you tell me. No, a little house, all painted, neat and tidy. A great big house. You have the conviction of all two-year-olds. I wish I had such certitude. Uh, yes, a great big house. And she went in. I remember, as I tell it, that the locks of Southey's heroine had silvered with age, the old woman and the three bears. Perhaps they had been golden once when she was a child. And now we are already up to the porridge. And it was too hot, and it was too cold, and then it was, we chorus, just right. The porridge is eaten. 
The baby's chair is shattered. Goldilocks goes upstairs, examines beds, and sleeps unwisely. But then the bears return. Remembering Southey still, I do the voices. Father bear's gruff boom scares you, and you delight in it. When I was a small child and heard the tale, if I was anyone, I was baby bear, my porridge eaten and my chair destroyed, my bed inhabited by some strange girl. You giggle when I do the baby's wail. Someone's been eating my porridge and they've eaten it. All up, you say. A response it is, or an amen. The bears go upstairs hesitantly. Their house now feels desecrated. They realize what locks are for. They reach the bedroom. Someone's been sleeping in my bed. And here I hesitate, echoes of old jokes, softcore cartoons, crude headlines in my head. One day your mouth will curl at that line. A loss of interest. Later, innocence. Innocence, as if it were a commodity. And if I could, my father wrote to me, huge as a bear himself, when I was younger, I would dower you with experience without experience. And I, in my turn, would pass that on to you. But we make our own mistakes. We sleep unwisely. The repetition echoes down the years. When your children grow, when your dark locks begin to silver, when you are an old woman alone with your three bears, what will you see? What stories will you tell? And then Goldilocks jumped out of the window and she ran together now, all the way home. And then you say, again, again, again. We owe it to each other to tell stories. These days, my sympathy is with Father Bear. Before I leave my house, I lock the door and check each bed and chair on my return. Again. 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 Thank you. Um, so Dave and I got, we, we were halfway through violent cases, and I heard from my friend Alan Moore that there were people from DC Comics in England on a talent scouting expedition. And I thought, well, we're talented, and we should be spotted. <laughs> so I got from Alan the phone number of uh, where they were staying, and I phoned them up. And uh, it was Karen Berger, and I said, can we come in and see you, an English writer, artist, Neil Gaiman, Dave McKean? And, and she said, yeah, sure, come in and see us. So I phoned Dave, and I said, we're going to see them, these people from DC. And he said, they're just being polite. They don't actually want to see us. And I said, yes, they do. <laughs> they said, yes. And he said, they're just being polite. <laughs> but two days later, we were turning up in some hotel in London. And we went up to the hotel room, and we knocked and went in. And it was Dick Giordano and Karen Berger. And Karen actually realized who I was at that point and um, had read a short script that I'd written and liked it. And then we showed them Dave's art, and they were completely blown away by it. And they said, well, would you like to do something for us? And we said, yes. And I would pitched a phantom stranger story, I think, which they'd said no to, because they already had one that was ongoing. And anyway, Grant Morrison had come in that morning and already pitched another one to them, and they'd had to say no to him. So. We just started throwing characters at them. And anything that I could come up with, somebody was doing. And finally, in some kind of weird desperation, I said, Black Orchid. And Karen said, Black Hawk Kid? Who's he? <laughs> and Dick Giordano said, Oh, Black Orchid. Yeah, I remember her. Good costume. OK. So we walked out, going downstairs. And Dave said they were just being polite. <laughs> I said, no, no, they meant it. 
He said they were being polite. I said, I think they meant it. He said, even if they meant it, what have you got me into? I'm going to have to draw like a superheroine in a cute costume for 150 pages. He said, I like that, that stuff that you were talking about doing with Swamp Thing and the, you were going to do something ecological in the Amazon rainforest. I said, I'll get that in. <laughs> so we went down to the lobby and uh, we, uh, the, on the way home, I figured out the plot of Black Orchid. And the next morning, I phoned Dave at the art college. Actually, you must have phoned me, I suppose, because you were at the payphone. Um, <laughs> so uh, Dave phoned me, and I told him the plot. Hadn't really occurred to me that he was in a corridor in an art college, or that there would be people behind him who wanted to use the phone because this was in the olden days, and they didn't all have their own ones. And uh, slowly the line got longer and longer, and Dave is just standing there like this. <laughs> People at the back of the line are convinced it's an artistic happening. <laughs> and it's me spending 55 minutes telling Dave the plot of Black Orchid. And he went home that night and did some concept paintings, we dropped them off with the people at DC Comics before they went back to America, and they gave us the job. As far as I can tell, in, in later conversation, mostly because we'd had the original conversation on the Thursday morning, and we'd given them the art and the full proposal on Sunday, and they figured that maybe we could be trusted to get the work in. <laughs> um, so, Dave and I were halfway through um, we, were, we were about, I think, halfway through Black Orchid and the phone call came saying, look, we're a bit worried about this Black Orchid thing. And I said, why? And they said, well, you're two people nobody's ever heard of doing a character nobody can remember and a female character of that and they don't sell. And I said, point. <laughs> um, and she said, well, so what, I said, well, what are your plans? She said, well, we're going to give Dave this thing, Arkham Asylum, with Grant Morrison, and we thought maybe you'd like to do a monthly comic, and that way we'll raise your profiles, and Black Orchid will work. And I said, okay. And she said, who do you want to do as a monthly character? And I, I said, started listing characters, and they were either all gone or whatever. And then Karen said, but we had that conversation about Sandman. Would you like to do that? And I said, sure. And that was how it started. And of course, Dave did the covers. This is called The Day the Sources Came. And it's also about stories. That day, the sources landed, hundreds of them, golden, silent coming down from the sky like great snowflakes. And the people of Earth stood and stared as they descended, waiting, dry-mouthed, to find what waited inside for us. And none of us knowing if we would be here tomorrow. But you didn't notice it, because that day, the day the sources came, by some coincidence, was the day that the graves gave up their dead. And the zombies pushed up through soft earth or erupted, shambling and dull-eyed, unstoppable, came towards us, the living, and we screamed and ran. But you did not notice this, because on the saucer day, which was the zombie day, it was Ragnarok also. <laughs> and the television screens showed us a ship built of dead men's nails, a serpent, a wolf, all bigger than the mind could hold, and the cameraman could not get far enough away, and then the gods came out. But you did not see them coming, because on the saucer zombie battling gods day, the floodgates broke, and each of us was engulfed by genies and sprites offering us wishes and wonders and eternities and charm and cleverness and true brave hearts and pots of gold while giants fifo fummed across the land and killer bees. But you had no idea of any of this because that day, the saucer day, the zombie day, the Ragnarok and fairies day, 
the day the great winds came and snows and the cities turned to crystal, the day all plants died, plastics dissolved, the day the computers turned, the screens telling us we would obey, the day angels, drunk and muddled, stumbled from the bars and all the bells of London were sounded, the day animals spoke to us in Assyrian, the Yeti day, the fluttering capes and arrival of the time machine day. You didn't notice any of this because you were sitting in your room, not doing anything, not even reading, not really, just looking at your telephone, wondering if I was going to call. So I did Sandman and Dave did the covers. And then we started collecting them into books and Dave did the covers of the books. And it was the single strangest collaboration. In the beginning, I had exact outlines. We'd work over, we'd talk covers, we had plans. Um, by the end, I was behind and Dave was doing covers six months at a time. He'd had clear out the time in a week to do six months' worth of Sandman covers. Um, inspired, partly, by the time after about Sandman 9 that Karen fired him. Um, she told him that she needed him to work on... Was it Arkham? Yeah. Needed him to work on Arkham Asylum full-time. It was a big Batman book. It was very important, and so she took him off Sandman. And Dave's response to this was really interesting. He got home and did the next six Sandman covers <laughs> and sent them off to her, at which point she sort of... I don't, think, I don't think she ever officially unfired you. She just used them and never said anything more about it again. Is that... <laughs> um, technically, Dave was fired at Sandman number nine and has remained fired ever since. Um, <laughs> But he was the public face of Sandman, and it was wonderful, and it was very strange, and it was the only thing that was consistent, and every storyline, we'd reinvent what we were doing. Um, reinvent it as well as we possibly could, and we'd, if we'd done something that was beautiful paintings, then we may, might move to photographs. Sometimes I got to um, come up with suggestions. I remember for the, the Distant Mirrors covers, I'd mentioned to Dave that I'd always liked the, the Milton Glaser Shakespeare covers, where he'd done little black and white drawings with little patches of color on them. And um, we, we reinterpreted that, or stole the idea, actually. <laughs> but reinterpreted sounds so much better than stole. Um, and we did 75 covers, plus um, all of the books and bunches of little side art. But we, we still kept doing things. Dave pointed out Signal to Noise, which we did in the face. Mr. Punch, um, which is probably, in, in many ways, the most autobiographical thing I've done. Um, <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> One of my aunts read it and said, I didn't know that you remembered that stuff. And I had to say, actually, it was before I was born and I was just making a story based around bits of it. And the horrible feeling that one might actually have struck gold <laughs> more or less accidentally. Um, but it is sort of autobiographical. And it's also one of those things I'm really happy with. You know, mostly when you do something, you just look at it and see how very, very far away it is from the platonic ideal you had in your head. And Mr. Punch was one of those things where I don't really mind if anybody else likes it, but I was very happy with it. Um, we did the day I swapped my dad for two goldfish, mostly because I'd written it, and we didn't know what else to do with it. <laughs> so Dave drew it, and we gave it to a small company that said that they were going to be publishing lots of children's books, but they didn't. They just published that one. So then we had to wait until they went out of business before we could get a real publisher to do it. Um, but in the meantime, I'd somehow become a children's author, more or less to my surprise. Um, my daughter, Holly, used to come home from kindergarten, and she'd see me writing. And she'd want to do it. And she'd 
come in and sit up on my lap, and I'd open a new document, and she'd dictate these nightmarish little stories about <laughs> small girls um, normally escaping <laughs> evil women who were pretending to be their mothers. <laughs> um, who would normally at some point in the story lock them in the cellar. We didn't even have a cellar. I don't know where she got the cellar from, but kids were locked in the cellar. And I thought, this is so cool. I should, I should get some more stories like this and read them to her. You know, cool little stories for the, the Wednesday Adams in your life. <laughs> and, and there weren't any. So I started writing one so that I could read it to her. And that was Coraline. And I got about a third of the way through it, having been told by my editor on Good Omens that it was a brilliant book and completely unpublishable. <laughs> so I was just writing it in my own time because I didn't think anyone would ever publish it. And then uh, we moved to America, and I ran out of my own time. So about six years after moving to America, I sent the book to what this first three or four chapters to my editor, Jennifer uh, Hershey, at Avon Books, and said, would you mind reading this? And she read it. She phoned me up, and she said, it's really cool. What happens next? And I said, send me a contract and we will both find out. <laughs> so she did. And I finished it. And um, I'd always planned that either I'd get Edward Gorey to do the illustrations or I'd get Dave. And it was, it was a hard one, because I'm going, Dave McKean, Edward Gorey, Edward Gorey, Dave McKean... But then Edward Gorey settled everything for me by dying three days before I finished it. <laughs> so it was Dave. <laughs> Luckily, he said yes when I asked him. I don't know what I would have done if he'd said no. You know, knocking on the grave going, Mr. Gorey, I know you're dead, but just, just one book. Um, but Dave said yes, and we did Coraline together. This is a poem called Instructions, and it's about what to do if you find yourself in a fairy tale. Touch the wooden gate in the wall you never saw before. Say please before you open the latch. Go through, walk down the path. A red metal imp hangs from the green painted front door as a knocker. Do not touch it, it will bite your fingers. Walk through the house. Take nothing, eat nothing. However, if any creature tells you that it hungers, feed it. If it tells you that it is dirty, clean it. If it cries to you that it hurts, if you can, ease its pain. From the back garden, you will be able to see the wild wood. The deep well you walk past leads to winter's realm. There is another land at the bottom of it. If you turn around here, you can walk back safely. You will lose no face. I will think no less of you. Once through the garden, you'll be in the wood. The trees are old. Eyes peer from the undergrowth. Beneath a twisted oak sits an old woman. She may ask for something. Give it to her. She will point the way to the castle. Inside it are three princesses. Do not trust the youngest. <laughs> walk on. In the clearing beyond the castle, the twelve months sit about a fire, warming their feet, exchanging tales. They may do favours for you, if you are polite. You may pick strawberries in December's frost. Trust the wolves, but do not tell them where you are going. The river can be crossed by the ferry. The ferryman will take you. The answer to his question is this. If he hands the oar to his passenger, he will be free to leave the boat. Only tell him this from a safe distance. If an eagle gives you a feather, keep it safe. Remember that giants sleep too soundly, that witches are often betrayed by their appetites. Dragons have one soft spot somewhere always. Hearts can be well hidden, and you betray them with your tongue. Do not be jealous of your sister. 
Know that diamonds and roses are as uncomfortable when they tumble from one's lips as toads and frogs, colder too and sharper, and they cut. Remember your name. Do not lose hope. What you seek will be found. Trust ghosts. Trust those that you have helped to help you in their turn. Trust dreams. Trust your heart and trust your story. When you come back, return the way you came. Favours will be returned, debts be repaid. Do not forget your manners. Do not look back. Ride the wise eagle, you shall not fall. Ride the silver fish, you will not drown. Ride the grey wolf, hold tightly to his fur. There is a worm at the heart of the tower. That is why it will not stand. When you reach the little house, the place your journey started, you will recognize it, although it will seem much smaller than you remember. Walk up the path and through the garden gate you never saw before but once, and then go home, or make a home, or rest. And I think it's time for Dave and I to get into conversation now. So do you want to come up and we'll go and... So your specialist subject... <laughs> <laughs> oh, he just died. Magnus Magnusson. He did? He did. That means nothing to these no, people. No, I know. Just have a private conversation. That's yes. It's very strange hearing that conversation about that, that anecdote about DC Comics because I have never known to this. I know it sounds strange, 20 years on, I've never known whether those people from DC knew who we, how we were turning up in their hotel room. I still am unsure because Karen Berger opened the door and had that look on her face I don't want to offend these people, they might be important, I better be polite. Uh, and that was, the that was at least half of the, of the, of the one-hour meeting was people in a room going, I don't want to say, who the hell are you? <laughs> uh, I just want to play along until this all clicks into place. So I still don't know whether that's true. They were just being polite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if they were English, I can actually imagine they might have given us a commission <laughs> for Black Orchid out of politeness, just not, wanting, <laughs> yes, yes. not actually wanting to offend us and uh, say no. We could I have actually so. got an entire career out of... Yeah. You know, Meanwhile, the people they were really waiting for are still stuck in traffic somewhere. Yes. <laughs> so, I, we sort of stopped, I stopped my sort of little burble at, at Mirror Mask. Um, that was the point where we discovered we were incompatible. We'd been working together at that point for 17 years <laughs> under the conviction that we were perfectly compatible. We'd had one argument in the enti that entire time over Batman's dialogue yeah. in Black Orchid because you felt it was unrealistic. And I'm going, it's Batman. It's Batman. What do you expect? <laughs> You're going to bring, bring realism in at this, this late stage? Yeah. I remember that conversation. Yeah. It taught me a lot. I'm going, it's good Batman dialogue. <laughs> That's what Batman says. You're saying, yes, but nobody would actually say, you know, this is my city. It's, I said, I don't care. It's what Batman is. Batman. He's, got, he's got a little ears. He's got ears. <laughs> Yes. I actually got to be, but, but what is bizarre though is through you, I got to be, <coughs> I got to live out my, my childhood dream of growing up to be Batman. Um, True. You know, I didn't know. That, you know, obviously when I was six years old, I wanted to grow up to be Batman, because you do. No, so it, which is the weird thing about the whole Robin character who's created to give kids somebody to identify with. And you go, he's really irritating. I'm, nobody has ever gone, I want to grow up to be Robin. <laughs> Nobody has even gone, I hope Robin dies and I'd be the next Robin. You just go, I want to be Batman, because that's what you want to be. Um, and because of that, I got to be Batman. I think it was actually because I have a big nose, and Dave really wanted a good nose for his Batman in Arkham Asylum. Yeah. yeah. So all of a sudden, I'm rolling around on the floor of my apartment in Nutley, um, 
with a broom handle halfway through me, and at one point trying to push a pair of glasses through my hand and making faces. You know, with Dave at the camera going, no, can you look more agonized? More agonized. And I'm going, I'm looking about as agonized, but if you actually look in Arkham Asylum, at those moments where it's human, it's me. So, so I got to grow up to be Batman. I, you know, I blacked all this out. I, I've forgotten it. <laughs> I've managed to wipe it from my memory. Coming back here, it all comes back to me. Terrible. But we were incompatible, um, which we discovered in the Jim Henson house. Surrounded by Kermit. <laughs> and Miss Piggy and Gonzo. Yes. Mostly Kermit. Yes. If you squinted in the room, you could see pre raf paintings and Degar. That Degar ballerina on the wall. All sorts of things. If you sharpened up, it was Kermit. It, it, Miss Piggy on a swing in the painting. And uh, Miss Piggy, Degar, and Kermit. Very strange house. Fantastic place. And Dave had half a plot and I had half a plot. And we sort of sat down and, and argued. Um, a lot of what we were arguing about was the way one writes and why we were there <laughs> and, what, and what we were doing what and, we doing there? and uh, trying to build this thing, which, which actually we kind of did. In, I mean, you know, it, it, it did come together. And we stopped glaring at each other on about day three. No, it was later. Yeah? <laughs> it was a good week into it. Um, I haven't written very much. Uh, but I have written a few things, and I've got used to a way of writing. I like to write everything I know about something on a little piece of paper. Everything. Every line of dialogue, every colour, every character, every... everything. He had a stack of three-by-five file cards all ready for writing everything awful. down on. Absolutely. I wrote everything out. And then I spread them all over the floor, all around me, so I can see the whole story around me. This big, very a sort of visual way of working. You can see the whole thing. And I found... And then he moves cards. I move them, you move them around. Because you can see there's a big hole over there. So there's a, there's a, you know, there's a problem there. So you start to try, sort of fill that stuff in. And then this bit over here is very clustered. And you, it's a very visual way of working. It makes complete sense. Um, and Neil here likes to, um, 9 o'clock in the morning, start his computer... Puts on Radio 4, which is talk radio, to work to. Talk radio, to work to. I mean, that's ridiculous. You can't do that. Um, and then he just sort of types away and brings characters on and just sees what they say to each other, which is crackers. I mean, you've got no way of knowing where you're going at all. My favourite moment was when he looked at me and he said, what you're doing is wrong. I said, I said, how do you mean it's wrong? He said, you're like an artist who's starting to draw a portrait beginning with the eyebrow. It's wrong. <laughs> it, was, it was two years later that I said, Dave, how do you start a portrait? And he said, often with the eyebrow. <laughs> yes. That's really not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we did get through it. But it is strange. I mean, I, actually, thinking about it, I think, you know, it's a lot to do with confidence. And I, I don't have much confidence as a writer because I haven't written that much. So I tend to, you know, need to plan everything out. And then, uh, uh, whereas Neil has a much more improvisational way of writing, and I have a much more improvisational way of drawing. So. Yeah, no, I definitely, if I, if I were writing. actually going to have to draw something, I. Want to do you it plan first. it all, I out, plan first. It all out first, yes. pieces of paper. I know you would. Yeah. I know you would. <laughs> we are not so different, <laughs> you and I. <laughs> ah. um, so right now, we're working on... The only thing we're actually doing together, which is very odd. I mean, for 20 years, there's always been something we've had going. And it's going to be a bit odd at the point where Crazy Hair finishes, where you finally, after four years, hand it in. Um, because technically, at that point, we won't, we won't be working on anything, will we? Except sort of for signal to noise, but that's sort of really you. Um, we'll have to start something. something. Yes. <laughs> Do you have any ideas? Just suggest yes. them during the course. 
on a small piece of paper that I can you know, <laughs> appreciate it. But why don't we go over to questions? Yes. I really want to know what you lot want to know, because we, we can... But the, the, the trouble with us being in conversation is we've been in conversation for 20 years. We know the answers. We know the conversation. It's, we've done the conversation. You guys are young. Were either of you scared by the movie Five Million Years to Earth? No. Were you? Why, I, what was that? When, oh. when either of us were young, were we scared by the movie Five Million Years to Earth? Well, I, I Isn't that one, the one that. with the big brainy things? What's the, what's that movie? Five million years to Earth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to mispronounce his last name. Nigel Keel Quartermass. Um, it was the Hammer version of Quartermass Three. Oh. And uh, right. We're really getting into esoterica here. Uh, the trouble, the, the biggest trouble for both of us is actually, I think we were both just. I I I was just too young, and Dave was too young. Um, <laughs> For for Prime Hammer, um, it was Prime Hammer. yes. You couldn't, you know, when I, I wasn't allowed, they were X films, and you weren't even allowed in with an adult. You weren't even allowed in if you bought a fake-looking beard <laughs> and put it on and tried to look as if it was yours. They would catch you, as I learned to my cost. Um, so no, I, I mean, you know, by the time that I was getting to watch, getting in to watch things like that, and they weren't on TV yet, because they were X films. So the film I got to be, the first thing that I actually got to be properly scared by was Son of Dracula. The Son of Dracula. Son of Dracula. Do you mean Son of Dracula? I mean Son of Dracula. Really Not a Harry bad. Nilsson no, film. no, no. I mean Son of Dracula. Son of Dracula is a Harry Nilsson film. Yes, but Son of Dracula is also um, Count Alucard coming to the swamps of Louisiana. Really? Yeah, it's crap. I've actually watched it. <laughs> I watched really? it again a few years ago just because I remembered it as being the single scariest thing that anybody can watch. <laughs> because it was from that that I learned. But the thing is, in that, Dracula comes into rooms by turning into smoke and going under doors, even locked doors. I was eight. I had figured out that you were safe from monsters if you shut the door. It was a good thing to have figured out. I was, I was very happy living in a world in which, yes, there were monsters. Yes, there were really scary things out there. You shut the door. <laughs> Suddenly, doors were no protection. It was like a kid watching Doctor Who, discovering that they could come behind the sofa, um, which will mean nothing to any of you. It's, <laughs> again, it's, sorry, obscure cultural reference. Yes. I hope somebody in England watching this on the podcast just smiled. <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> you see, Son of Dracula is, is, is Apple films. Yes, Harry Nilsson. Harry Nilsson as Dracula. And Ringo Starr as Merlin. <laughs> Just absolutely it's true. It's true. Um, it was, it, but that is the film of the same name. And it's the, it's the, first, it's, <laughs> yes. it's the first album I ever bought. Because I, I just like the cover. And, um, and then I, got in, I really love Harry Nilsson's voice. And I heard, and, I, and so that was the first album I ever bought. And I only saw the film last year. And it's awful. <laughs> it's awful on a level it, that you didn't know awful existed at. <laughs> Astonishing film. By the way, I saw on the internet this morning, Dracula's house is for sale in Romania, $40 million. Wow. Amazing looking castle. If any of you have $40 million, need a castle. Apparently, it has paying visitors, so it will sort of look after itself after a while. Another question. Who's next? Who is our microphone person? Somebody put your hands up. If there was a hand. I'm, I have uh, children, and I'm trying to figure out um, how to deal with the violent imagery. I've only let the oldest one look at the Sandman, and he's 13. And what is your relationship to the violence that you depict and draw and write? Um, well, mostly that of the, the creator. Um, <laughs> I, I tend to be um, tend to be very wussy about violence unless it's necessary. When I get incredibly enthusiastic about it, <laughs> which is um, you know, I, I honestly don't know that Sandman. I've met very few kids who were into Sandman. Um, 
But they weren't not into, you know, it wasn't about the violence. It was the fact that, honestly, if you're 12, Sandman's pretty boring. Um, it's people standing around talking a lot. And it's people with motivations that are fairly puzzling, unless you're actually an adult. Um, so I, I tend to feel that mostly, you know, censorship, um, you, readers are self-selecting. Kids tend not to read stuff they're not ready for. Kids are very good at looking at something and going, oh, that's not for me, not yet. Um, and kids are also very good at figuring out when they're getting at the point where they're curious about something, whether it's, it's sex violence or something else, or politics. They, that's the point where they gravitate to that material. Um, I wouldn't put extreme violence in something that I was making for kids because it would upset parents. Um, <laughs> I remain unconvinced that it would, it would upset kids, though. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I don't know about the, the whole... Uh, I mean, I think my, my point of view has changed, really. I think it's probably since I became, had children of my own. Um, I, I just don't find violence entertaining or amusing or any of those things. But, I mean, I, I've, read, I've read things about, I think violence is so much in the eye of the beholder. I, I remember reading with bizarre bemusement back in the early days of Amazon.com and Wolves in the Walls went up and I thought, what are people saying? And there's some woman ranting on about having picked this thing up and it's filled with Wolves with blood all it's over their jaws. Particularly stupid person, that was. <laughs> uh, because it was jam, it was strawberry jam. <laughs> and, the, and, and this review by somebody who absolutely hated the book. Actually, you were the one that showed me reviews on Amazon. I didn't know there were reviews on Amazon. And Neil happened to be at my house and showed me the reviews. And they were all really good reviews, I was happy to say, apart from this one <laughs> by this woman who hated it. She hated the drawings in it. She hated the blood all over the walls. Oh, strawberry jam. She hated everything about it. She hated the story, the type, everything. Absolutely hated, hated it. And then had to give it a score out of five. And in her fury, you could see her at home going, oh, oh, oh. and she pressed five accidentally. <laughs> and and uh, couldn't take it back. And so she gave us five out of five. And you can see her at home going, oh my God! <laughs> Return, return, no! So, <laughs> the only reason why we got a straight five out of five <laughs> review is this woman couldn't control her index. Yes. <laughs> Another question. Let's, let's go on this side of the... Actually, the only thing about violence, I was just going to finish that, because I'm kind of dealing with it with a film script that I'm writing at the moment, or trying to. And I'm trying to think of stories and, and, and things that, that don't have violence in, that don't have guns in, I mean, just because I think it's, you know, it's worth trying to. Um, and I think the thing is, it's irreversible. I, I'm inter interested in this film called Irreversible. There's a film called Gas by Gus by Noe called Irreversible. And actually, it's an amazing film. It's astonishingly well made. It's just an incredibly intense amazing film, and I wish I hadn't seen it. Um, and I'd be happy if, if it was not in my head. Um, and I don't think he should have made it. And I think that little conversation, to be honest, I've just been having with myself. I don't think it should be censored. I don't think it should be taken off the shelves. I think people should be free to see it. But I would, personally, I would be happy not to have seen it. But having seen it, it's irreversible, as in the title. That's why it's such a clever piece. But anyway. So, yes. Were either of you involved in improbable theaters making of Wolves in the Wall, or have you seen it? Or? I, I was more involved with, than Dave was, because Dave was up to his eyeballs in making Vampire Lestat, um, the, the, the musical. So he was getting to jet off. <laughs> <laughs> he was getting to jet off to New York and swan around with Elton John, who he started calling Reg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And I was eating sandwiches in Glasgow, um, in the Tramway Theatre Glasgow. I suspect I had more fun. Um, the, um, it was great. It was, it was really <coughs> wonderful. I got to work with um, Nick Powell, who wrote the music, and, some of, and had taken some swatches of the book and put them to music. And there were places where we needed more songs, so I got to write more song lyrics. I got to be there. Um, at the very, very first couple of workshops, and um, Can you just insist they bring it here? I, I actually I do keep insisting that they bring it here. I know it's coming to America in the early part of 2008, and currently it doesn't come any further west than Chicago. And I keep sort of um, grumbling about this. <laughs> I think is the technical term and sort of saying, you know, um, I think Minneapolis, it would work really well, and not to mention, um, you know, San Francisco, there are an awful lot of people who would go and see it there and stuff. It's, it's wonderful. The, the, the wolf puppets are magnificent. It looks like a Dave McKean drawing that's come to life. The, the house is, um, you know, it, it's, it's very Dave, um, visually, and it's absolutely odd and goofy and quirky, and the songs are the songs are great, but they're also very hard to describe. It, it, musically, it doesn't really sort of... We wound up calling it... We, we started out saying that it was an opera, and then we thought we can't call it an opera because nobody will come. <laughs> um, and then we... But we didn't want to call it a musical because that set up a bunch of expectations about what kind of thing it was that then weren't going to get fulfilled. It's not a musical. It's 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 thing. So... Uh, they asked me to come up with a description, and I said, OK, it's a musical pandemonium. <laughs> so it's Wolves in the Walls is a musical pandemonium. And um, if anybody saw Improbable Theatre's uh, rather wonderful, um, I was about to say Peter. Edward Scissorhands, Shock Edward Peter. Peter. <laughs> yes, um, you will know it's not like that at all. <laughs> uh, because that's a really scary children's this piece of children's theater for adults, whereas Wolves and the Walls is really scary children's theater for children. It, it was only really, really scary once. I still haven't figured that one out. We, we sort of pulled it back a bit from there. But we were in previews, and we changed things with every preview. And the second preview, I still don't know quite what we did, because part of me would love to put it back. We changed a whole bunch of stuff after that. Um, but in the second preview, Kids were screaming. <laughs> and there was a level of hysteria and terrified screaming to the point where I'm sitting there going, they will be cleaning the wee off the seats after this is done. <laughs> um, and <laughs> so after that, we sort of went, OK, that was too much, and that was too much. We pulled a load of stuff back. And it, it, it's never quite, but it's never felt dangerous since. And I did mm. rather enjoy it when it felt just a little bit dangerous. <laughs> Um, first of all, I'm 14 and I'm reading Sandman right now, so I kind of contradict your answer to that. And, but also, um, how did you get into this new Eternal series that's been going on? Um, the new et the Eternal series started many years ago um, when I found myself uh, dealing with a millionaire comics publisher who made a bunch of agreements, both verbally and in writing um, about copyright and various other things, and who went back on them all. And um, when I, I challenged him on this, he basically said, I'm a millionaire, sue me. So I did. <laughs> um, and in order to have, I needed a, a fighting fund in order to be able to do that. So Marvel had uh, long wanted me to do something for them. and. Uh, we put together a deal for two comic series. And the first of them was 1602, which I did back in uh, 2001, 2002, 2003. And um, the, then there was still another one. And we couldn't quite decide what it was going to be. And Joe Quesada, um, who is the editor-in-chief at Marvel, one day said to me, what about the Eternals? Do you remember them? And I said, yeah, I, I like them. 
They were, they were weird. And he said, well, we got them. They're still floating around the Marvel Universe. And it was, they were sort of, and Jack Kirby didn't create them to be part of the universe. So when they were incorporated, it was a bit of a mess. And would you like to, you know, would you like to overhaul them? And I thought about it and said, sure. So that was, that was the Eternals. Um, I discovered that I was really out of practice at writing sort of monthly comics. The point I realized quite how out of practice I was, it was maybe a six issue miniseries. And it is now officially the first seven issue miniseries, <laughs> six issue miniseries um, that will ever come out because I got to the end of sort of halfway through issue six and phoning my editor and going, I'm, I can't finish it in time. I know this is a double length issue, but we've got all this stuff left over. Can I go to issue seven? And he said, yeah. <laughs> so, so it is a seven issue, six issue miniseries. Um, and on, and on, in terms of age for reading Sandman, I've actually known, you know, I've known a couple of nine year olds who loved Sandman and seemed to read it and enjoy it and get an awful lot out of it. Um, but what I was saying was not that there is an age cutoff limit. What I'm saying is that people are self-selecting. Uh, people are very good at finding the stuff they're ready for. And for many of them, you know, I think it, it's probably safe to say that the majority of 14-year-old comic reading boy, uh, comics reading boys are probably much more interested in the kind of comics where people hit other people through walls, <laughs> and then the other people get up and say, now you've made me really angry <laughs> than they would be in Sandman. But that's a generalization. And like all generalizations, it's sort of dodgy. <laughs> Another, so, uh, somebody over, do we have a mic over this? Uh, yes. When uh, dealing with the larger comic book companies like DC or Marvel, and you have heroes that have continuity problems, or there's been a reboot, or a miniseries has just negated something else, all these retcons. Do you ever get frustrated uh, with the series you're working on, or do you just say, screw it, and go with whatever you're doing? Actually, that was more or less the reason why Sandman stopped very, very early on um, being part of the DC universe in terms of what I was doing. Because every time I do something, I get the phone call saying, oh, that doesn't apply anymore. And, you know, we'd, we'd, um, I'd write the scene with the Joker hanging himself as an April Fool's Day joke in Arkham Asylum, and it would be signed off online, and everybody all the way up to the top of DC would approve, and they'd start drawing it, and suddenly we'd get the phone call saying, um, actually, we've just decided that the Joker's He's just uh, vanished between, beneath the waves of the Gotham River and cannot be seen in any DC Comics title for the next eight months. And I go, but he's in this. Well, he can't be. Make it the Scarecrow. Oh, all right. And that sort of, <laughs> so you'd, you'd run into that. And it only had to happen a few times. And I'd go, right, I'm just going to deal with characters. And I, thought, I, liked, I still loved, I thought part of the joy of doing Sandman was I might as well go and take all these cool, strange old characters, I just wouldn't take the ones that anybody cared about. So I always knew that I was OK whenever I'd phone my editor and say, well, can I use Element Girl? And she'd say, well, who's she? <laughs> and I'd go, yes, OK. <laughs> you know, the point I'd phone up and say, I'm bringing back Prez. Prez? It's OK. So that was fun. Um, the last time, I, I tried one final time to bring in superheroes at the very end of Sandman. I've got a dream. I thought, well, I, I should bring in Batman and Superman, and, and I'll have them at the wake, too, showing that everybody's there, even the DC Universe. And, and I had, um, in the instructions to the artist, I said, Superman is Clark Kent. He's wearing his suit as you know, his reporter suit, his glasses. But his cape, Superman cape, is coming down the back. And he's looking over, trying to see it rather nervously. Because I figured if I was Superman and I was dreaming, I'd always be dreaming that people would say, oh, God, I left my cape out. People know I'm Superman. <laughs> I thought that's obviously what you're going to dream about. You know? and, and we did that. And the Superman editor said that it was um, not properly respectful of the character. <laughs> yeah. And, and made them take that bit out. I so don't care about that kind of thing. <laughs>
I, I, I've come across it once and once only and never again um, in this Batman book, Arkham. Grant had written, Grant Morrison had written a lot of the tradition, the DC characters. Most of them I didn't know who the hell they were. The Joker, obviously, I knew, and Two-Face, with the split face, I knew. The others I didn't know at all. But there was a character called Clayface. Beats the hell out of me. But Grant had written him as the sort of personification of disease and decay, and he, would, he was sort of walking down these grim alleys of uh, back, back, back corridors of Arkham with his hand trailing along the wall and le leaving a sort of snail trail on the wall. I mean, fantastic visual stuff. I mean, it was like a Schwankmeyer film. It was really terrific. Um, and, and nobody wanted, uh, everybody stayed away from him. The touch of him, you know, was the thing, uh, this sort of personification of disease. Um, and actually, that's great. I mean, there's a sort of iconic character. So I started to draw it. Um, and then DC sent me the, the style sheet of Clayface. And he's got a sort of goldfish bowl on his head or something. But he's got a musket, he's got a superhero body out here. God, I should, you know, anybody should look so diseased. He looks, he looks great, you know, he looked like <laughs> Charles Atlas. So, I mean, that just went out the window. I just drew this sort of little wizened old man and, and it was never, never brought up. But, I mean, that kind of stuff is just ridiculous. You know, so. Just ignore it. Last few questions. We've got one down at the front here. We haven't, actually, the mics haven't come down to the front. Let's, let's come down. Let's come down to the front lines. If you we'll do a few people in the middle. We've just got sort of been in this band up there, two thirds of the way up there. Lucky people. Go so ahead. I think yes. Mike first. Yep. You. Okay. Go for it. Okay. This is for both of you. What is the very first bedtime story that you can each remember being told? Bizarrely, the I first knew, I story... Knew, I knew it was going to start like that. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, actually, the, fir the very first bedtime stories I remember being told were by my father, who used to tell us stories about a couple of squirrels, small grey squirrels who lived in the trees near us and would have adventures and fight evil foxes. <laughs> and they were called Squibby and Squirky. And I remember the, um, the worst part of that was when we moved. And I'm saying, but, but they lived in our tree outside our old house. We're hundreds of miles away. How can you tell stories about them? Um, what's really weird, though, is that the, the stories, the bedtime stories I remember actually content of, um, I couldn't have been more than about Three. I was a really early reader, which was kind of useful. Um, and they were, it was this, it, it was comics. It was all sort of lying in bed with the door open just enough to read by in bed after I'm not meant to be up at all. And with these strange English comics, um, and I don't even remember what the title was, whatever these things they were, they did in England comics for three-year-olds, these little painted comics, and it was woodland animals having adventures with jam. <laughs> A lot of woodland animals in England, um, in stories, and, but it was these, these little, you know, happy hedgehogs and things, and they'd made jam, and by the end of it, there was jam everywhere. <laughs> could, have been, could have been blood, I suppose, could now. Have been but, blood. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> what, what happened next? <laughs> uh, I'm not I, going I, to tell you. I, I can't remember. Uh, get out of it that way. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to do a nationwide walking story again. Neil is so bored of this. Yeah, go for the it. First, uh, I, first thing I really remember sort of having an effect was um, I, there was a terrible, boring, bland, banal television program called Nationwide. It was on in England. It was about six o'clock. It was just local news. It was dull and boring. And, and, you know, you come home from school, my dad would come home from work, it would just be on in the background, we'd have some tea. It was just drab stuff. People would, you know, go out to see the latest patch of 
cabbages grown in Norfolk. I mean, it was just <laughs> dreadful stuff. Uh, and I, we were sitting around, and one evening, they, they said, oh, we're now going over to the, uh, the Isle of Wight for a story. And I have to say uh, to some members of, uh, our, you know, people out there, young, younger, younger viewers may find this disturbing. This had never, I mean, this was a really strange thing to say. And we all went, what was that? <laughs> and then this, this piece came up with these families reporting, seeing this sort of um, uh, figure that was erect like a man, but very shaggy. Um, people have been calling it a sort of wolf man or, or whatever, you know, because just for... And, it had appear, and this particular couple had said they'd woken up at some, some three in the morning or something, and this figure had been in their doorway, and it had bounded down the stairs and out the house. In the context, now the context is the thing. The context is in this banal program about local events. And there's this sort of slightly strange story. And it was absolutely deadpan, absolutely played straight. And I still don't know whether it was a joke. It might have been April the 1st. It might have some, been some stupid joke, like the spaghetti trees and things like this. It might have been. But I still don't know. And it terrified the hell out of me. Um, and I'm tempted to say this was just three years ago or something, but it wasn't. I was, you know, very young. And it absolutely terrified me. Um, and I, would, I, rem I absolutely remember going to bed and with the hallway over there in, in the doorway doing that, you know, go, <laughs> to see if the wolf man was uh, in the... For a long time. I mean, that re absolutely terrified me. And, I, you know, I, you don't know what you take from these things. But I think the thing you take from it is context is everything. If you play one context, one, ex one expectation against something else, it's very powerful. Um, and actually, that's something I've always tried to do in the story, you know, the things that we've done. Um, you know, you, you think you know one kind of story or one kind of image or whatever, and you twist it or change it. And it's very strong to do that. So, anyway. We're probably on the last couple of questions here. Who's got the microphone? Okay, go for it. Um, right. So. You know how Jill Thompson did that um, little manga spin-off from Sandman, Death at Death's Door? Yep. And also I heard that um, there's going to be a prequel to a Mirror Mask released by Tokyo Pop, also yep. in manga style. I was wondering if you're going to be, either of you, at all involved with that, and if you're at all interested in manga? I think the, the Mirror Mask prequel died, um, mostly because we could never get it together. Um, the writer they had didn't do anything on it, and it just sort of... Um, and I, I think if, if we really wanted to push it back, but I wasn't going to write it, and Dave wasn't going to draw it, so we let it go. Um, I, you know, there's, there's not part of me that goes, I need to do manga to be artistically complete. There are lots of things that I still have to do, um, but doing Sandman and doing all the different Sandman and all the different ways that I did sort of definitely got the urge to tell 10 year long stories in narrative illustrated form out of my system for that thing. And I think that would be the same thing. Um, Dave's actually done some Japanese work. Um, you know that beautiful story for a oh, Japanese just publisher. A short, yes. just a short. It was gorgeous. Um, <laughs> But it was a short story. But it was actually published in Japan. It's really strange. Sandman is actually published in Japan, which is... And what's really weird is that Sandman the Dream Hunters is published in Japan, which is the one that Amano illustrated, where at the end, at the back of the book, I made up a story about how this was an old Japanese story and not a story made up by me. And it was a story made up by me. It wasn't an old Japanese story. But I thought it was just more sort of, you know, that the fun thing. And I thought nobody is actually going to believe that this is an old Japanese story with Cain and Abel and the Sandman in it and stuff. <laughs> and apparently I managed, I think partly it was because of the typeface, because we ran out of space. So it was printed so small that anybody who read this, it looks, small print looks so authoritative. <laughs> um, so, but what's really weird now is once it got translated, the people 
re, who, who the, 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 the inquiries as to where they could find the original on this started flooding in from Japan. <laughs> Uh, where I thought everybody's going to, you know, when it's published in Japan, nobody's going to think, ah, this is an ancient Japanese story, and apparently everybody thought it was an ancient <laughs> Japanese story. <laughs> Japanese universities writing to me, and I just got more and more embarrassing writing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're up to the last question. It's Who very, has very the dangerous, that stuff. I wrote uh, in, in one of our DVDs, I, uh, uh, CDs, I showed you the, my little record label CDs, I wrote a little piece... Uh, in the second one, how I'd met Ian Ballamy, the sax player. Um, I made it up completely. I made up this little story about being in Prague, and um, I was just wandering around at three in the morning, which is semi-true, and found this little jazz club. And Ian was happened to be playing, and I went in, and um, they were serving these strange drinks, and uh, his little band was playing. And out of the blue, uh, having you know previously met him two years ago, he was there, and we said hi, and he was playing this stuff, and it was recorded. And the next day, I tried to find the place, and there was nothing there. There was just some flyers on the ground, but the building was gone. It was derelict, and it all moved on. It was this sort of strange caravan jazz club that just sort of moved. <laughs> People absolutely believe this was fact. Uh, <laughs> trying to tell, ask me where it was appearing next, in which European city would they next see <laughs> the feral jazz club? Nightmare. And the other one is um, I did a catalogue, which I showed the cover for, for a touring exhibition, and I got a few people to write little introductions, and Keith Griffiths wrote one. Keith is the producer for the Quay Brothers films, and hopefully he'll be producing uh, Signal to Noise, this feature film we're trying to do next. And he's a great guy, but he also just made it up. Um, and he started his little piece about the fact that, um, I think it was about four or five hundred years ago, a meteorite struck Kent. And um, I, my house is located at the epicenter <laughs> of the meteorite strike, uh, with these strange sort of magnetic fields surrounding it and all that kind of stuff. Every bloody interview I do now starts with, so you, are, you live in the middle of a meteorite. <laughs> How is this like? I mean, is the meteor... Jeez. Email Keith. You see what you've done? It gets worse when it gets online because then Wikipedia links to it and yeah. says it's true. And then it's, then it's facts forever. So, so we have our last question, I think, yes. over here. Um, it has to be really good. Yes. <laughs> Um, I just want to ask, I mean, Dave's work in animation, obviously, um, is a very interesting direction, probably a very natural direction. And I read when you interviewed him about his interest in Jans Venkmeyer um, and the Quay Brothers. And I'm just curious, uh, are you also familiar with the work of Barry Purvis? Barry Purvis? Now, I know the name. You have to remind me of the film. He, well, he's a British animator. Um, he Isn't he the one a, who did the Shakespeare? The one piece I remember most clearly was a piece um, where William Shakespeare was on a stage and essentially yes. performing every single one of his plays. Yes. Oh it's that little Ardman one with Shakespeare yes, doing yes, yes. the, the two-minute Shakespeare one. Yes. And Love there's it. so many qualities in, qualities in that, uh, in, in Purvis's work that, uh, you know, I had to wonder if uh, he was ever an influence for you. Uh, well, I, I, well to be, I guess not directly, no. Um, <laughs> I, since I'm struggling to remember who it was. Um, certainly the other names you mentioned, I mean, Schwankmeyer and um, the Quays I discovered in art school. I saw uh, a short film they made called The Street of Crocodiles, which um, I just recorded. It was on TV. I recorded it because it sounded strange and interesting, and I had no idea who the Quay brothers were. And it was on. It was at Christmas. It was. I think it was on Christmas Eve, and I recorded this thing, and I watched it every day for January, and it completely coloured my Christmas. Made for a very strange Christmas, uh, but fantastic. I, I, work. Do you remember the first time we went to see Schwenkmeyer's Alice at the ICA? I do, actually. We because um, uh, that was the first Schwenkmeyer film I yeah, ever saw. Yeah, we'd, we'd heard, I'd heard about Alice, and Dave and I, neither of us had seen any Schwenkmeyer. And they were showing it at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. And halfway through, there was a bomb alert. <laughs> and they threw us all out into the street and stopped the movie. Which actually, in some way, sort of added to it. <laughs> it's one of those yeah, moments where the, the complete experience of watching Alice, as far yeah. as I'm concerned, is not 
It's not really there unless halfway through watching it, someone's made you go out and stand in the street for 15 minutes, <laughs> wondering if you're all going to be blown to hell and back. What, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what got even stranger after that is I got it on video, and it became Holly's second favorite film after The Wizard of Oz. Um, which, and, and she's grown up so normal. <laughs> which, yeah. <laughs> the lesson, any of you have never... There's a lesson in there. Yes. I don't know if any of you have... If, if any of you haven't seen either The Street of Crocodiles by the Brothers Quay or um, Schwenkmeyer's Alice, both of them come as highly recommended in terms of strange filmic experiences yes. and uh, views into other people's heads as you will ever get. I met him in Prague. Schwenkmeyer? He was... Because, he, well, he lives in Prague. I mean, he's the, the animator of Prague. And he, he has a tiny little gallery in the ground floor of his house, right at the back of Prague, behind the big castle, the Cradcanny Castle on the hill. You go right behind this tiny little street with houses on, you wouldn't think anything of it. And down the bottom is the surrealist gallery of Jan Schwenkmeyer. And I knew it was there, and I looked it up, and I was, my wife was with me. We found the street, wandered down, wondered what we found. Just before we got there, a dog came out, and Schwenkmeyer came out, playing with his dog. <laughs> so I got to have a quick chat with Mr. Schwenkmeyer. He doesn't speak English, unfortunately. So that was, <laughs> we didn't really exchange much of any note, but uh, got to pat his dog. Was the dog covered in nails or yes. anything? <laughs> you definitely sort of expect the Schwenkmeyer dog to have nails. Yes, out. absolutely. A friend of mine went to see... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm rambling now. Uh, uh, went, went to see Joel Peter Witkin. Anybody know Joel Peter Witkin? Fantastic photographer. Always takes photographs of the strangest subjects. They drive out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, no idea where the hell they're going. They reach the end of a drive, maybe he lives there. So they start to edge down the drive, and this three legged dog comes out. <laughs> up. He must live here. He must live. This must be Schwankmeyer's place. This must be Wicked's place. So, yeah. so we are out of time. I think Sarah has an, an announcement to make. I'd say, first of all, thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> Okay. You're going you're to tell them who won the WASP name. I do have a quick announcement. Um, two, actually. Can we the stay and hear who won the WASP name? Yeah, we want to we know what the We want to know who won the WASP The name. microphone okay. isn't working backstage, okay. otherwise we'll never know. Um, there is no book signing after this event, but Rain Taxi did conduct a raffle that I hope you all put, a put in a ticket for, for um, a couple of signed copies of Wolves in the Walls. So pull out your tickets, and I'm going to read the numbers. First winner is... Five zero nine 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 six. Anyone? Right. Second one, five one one four zero three. Right. Woo. And lastly, five one zero 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 six. Ah, oh, so right. close. So close. One digit out. I've been there. <laughs> and lastly, because Neil brought up the Quay Brothers, I wanted to make a quick announcement that we are screening the Piano Tuner of Earthquakes, um, their feature-length film in a couple of weeks, along with several other films in a series called Expanding the Frame, which is all about experimental film. There are little pink brochures on your way out the door about that series, so please pick one of those up and come back. And some of those films are on Free Thursday, so hope to see you back in this very room for those. Thank you. Thank you.